This week at Starbase, Star Factory demolition wraps up. Ship 35 performs a long duration static fire at the Massey outpost. Booster 14 is returned to the launch site and the Pad B launch mount is lifted into place. Now let's dig into this week's update. Early Friday morning, Test Tank 17, a prototype for the Block 3 Super Heavy Booster, was rolled out of Star Factory and staged to roll onto the Massey Outpost. At the launch complex, another pump was added to the methane side of the ongoing tank farm expansion. Demolition work on the Star Factory building continued with the removal of the final glass elements before the last of the wedge would be pulled down. Overnight into Saturday, Test Tank 17 began rolling out to the Massey Outpost for structural proof testing. Several elements of the booster's design, including the redesigned lower thrust structure and liquid oxygen header tank, are being checked ahead of putting the Block 3 boosters into production. The continuous flight auger got off to an early start for the day, boring additional piling holes before sunrise. After sunrise, another wall panel section of the defunct high bay was lowered to the ground for scrapping. Starship 35 was brought out of Mega Bay 2, passing through the Sanchez site onto Highway 4 before heading down to the Massey outpost for another round of static testing. Meanwhile, two more pump motors were installed on the fuel side of the tank farm's new pumping station. Back at the Star Factory, the final side beams were cut off at the wedge section, taking out the last of the ties to the rest of the structure. With the supports gone now, the rest of the wedge was ready to come down. The roof section fell to pieces on impact, and crews quickly got to work cleaning up the wreckage. High bay demolition continued on Sunday morning as another wall segment was lowered to the ground. Over at Massey's, the tank farm began spooling up for a propellant to load on Ship 35. The two LR-11000 cranes performed a dress rehearsal for lifting the Pad B launch mount, practicing the tandem effort needed to install the heavy steel structure above the flame trench. Back at the Massey outpost, once the propellant lines were conditioned, Ship 35 was given a full load of oxygen and a small load of methane, just enough to last through the static fire. As the countdown reached zero, the deluge system was activated, but the static fire was aborted before ignition. After that, the ship was detanked to try again another day. Following the lift rehearsal, the Pad B launch mount was moved between the flame trench and the cranes for rigging. The Lieber cranes lowered their lifting jigs into the center of the launch mount. The rigging was then attached to the four pre-installed hold-down arms inside the table. With the rigging in place, the two cranes lifted the launch mount for the first time, making sure that the balance was right and that the hardware would be safely handled during the lift. The mount was then set back down on the transports. Against the golden glow of the Monday morning sunrise, the final launch mount lift began. The two cranes raised the mount above the surrounding structures before beginning to move towards the flame trench inch by inch. Carefully maneuvering the load, the cranes positioned the launch table above the supporting columns and began lowering it into place. The crane's process went slowly to make sure everything was perfectly aligned, and the cranes gently set the launch mount down on the four load-bearing columns. While the launch mount was being installed, the second attempt for Ship 35's second static fire began. The tank farm was spooled up and Ship 35's flap actuators were tested. After about a 30-minute fill time, Ship 35 was breathing fire. The three outer RVAC or Raptor vacuum engines and the inner three C-level Raptor engines all fired in unison. About 30 seconds into the test, we could see the inner engines move as the gimbal system was also tested. All systems seemed to perform nominal, with the RVAC shutting down first, followed by the inner Raptor engines after about a 60 second burn. Back at the build site, workers quickly began preparing Booster 14 for rollout, with the booster transport stand being brought to Mega Bay 1. Back at Massey's, Test Tank 17 was rigged up and lifted into the structural test cell. Mega Bay 1's doors were open and Booster 14 was brought out ahead of rollout to the launch complex. The booster followed Ship 35's route through Sanchez onto Highway 4 and began the journey down to the launch site, towering over the traffic behind it. After maneuvering through the launch site entrance, Booster 14 was brought to Pad A and set down next to the launch and integration tower. Starship 35 departed Massey's on Tuesday morning and headed back to the build site. The ship pulled in through the Sanchez gate, taking the back route into the factory area. 
Booster 14 was soon lifted onto the launch mount, ready for final preparations ahead of the second flight, which may come as soon as in the next couple of weeks. Ship 35 eventually finished its journey back, stopping outside of Mega Bay 2. A new vaporizer was delivered to the launch site, likely for the fuel side of the new pumping station. Back at the build site, Ship 35 was moved into Mega Bay 2 and connected to the overhead crane for placement on the center workstation inside the bay. Over at Pad B, the tower chopsticks were tested, opening and closing a few times. The final sliver of the Star Factory building was cut loose and pulled down early on Wednesday morning. With the structural demolition out of the way now, workers began breaking up the concrete in front of the old gate entrance. After the concrete pad was broken, an excavator started scooping up the remains and breaking it down into small chunks. A large ventilation line for the methane subcoolers was moved into place at the tank farm pumping station. One of the vertical vaporizers, previously removed after being damaged in Flight 8, was also reinstalled at the tank farm. Following the chopstick actuation test, the carriage was lowered back down to the hard stop after being stopped several times in the process. Late night tests were performed on the new tank farm equipment as build out continues with the new pumping stations. Starship 38's aft liquid oxygen tank section was moved out of Star Factory, stopping briefly outside Mega Bay 2 before being brought in for stacking. A booster barrel section was also rolled out of Star Factory and sent over to Mega Bay 1. This week at the Cape, a pair of large storage tanks were delivered by barge from Deer River. The two tanks were brought to the turning basin for unloading. The first of the two tanks was slowly inched off the barge, with crews making sure not to upset its balance on the water while the tank was wheeled off. With the first tank off the barge, it began heading over to LC-39A for installation at SpaceX's launch pad. The second tank was rolled off a bit later to make the same trip to 39A. A Falcon 9 booster and an encapsulated payload were moved to the horizontal integration facility for stacking ahead of flight. Starlink Group 6-91 was the first of the three launches this week, lifting off from Space Launch Complex 40 on Saturday for Booster 1083's 11th flight. Doug then returned to port with both fairing halves 168 and 185 from the mission. One of these fairing halves has now flown 30 missions. Signet Warhorse 3 brought home a short fall of Gravitas in Booster 1083 following the launch. The Falcon 9 was unloaded on the Port Canaveral docks, where it would remain for the next three days before being sent back to Roberts Road for refurbishment. One day after returning to Port Canaveral, Signet Warhorse 3 towed a short fall of Gravitas back out to sea for the Group 6-67 launch. That Starlink group then lifted off from Slick 40 on Wednesday morning, riding atop Falcon 9 Booster 1090 on its fourth flight into space and carrying 28 Starlink satellites into orbit. Starlink Group 6-83 was the third and final launch this week, lifting off from LC-39A just after midnight. Falcon 9 Booster 1067 carried another 28 Starlink satellites into space on the booster's record-setting 28th flight. Bob then returned to port a day later, carrying the fairing halves from that Starlink flight. Signet Warhorse 3 made its own return with just read the instructions two days later after the launch, bringing Booster 1067 back to Port Canaveral. Afterward, the Falcon was soon set down on the docks for post-flight stowage. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already, guys, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Lab Padre out.